In my first two videos, I showed you the Raleigh water test for testing flats. It's a great test and fun to do. But in this video, I'm going to show you some neat tricks on how to grind a flat um, and also some additional information that would be useful um, if you're making an auto collimation flat. The traditional way of making flats is to use three parts, A, B, and C, and you grind A against B, and then you grind A against C, and then C against B. Then you flip them over and you repeat the same cycle. You keep doing that over and over as you go through the grits, and eventually all three parts end up being flat. And that's great if you need three flats, but if you only need one, um, and maybe that you need a big one uh, that can run into some money so you may not always want to make three flats so um, don't make a three flats if you only need one make one flat but to do so you need some way to measure it to be flat and you might say well let's just use a spherometer and with an indicator and measure it flat but uh, you need a very sensitive indicator. Uh, I've got one here that is good enough. It, it, uh, its smallest divisions are 0.5 microns, which is actually only uh, uh, one wave or, or two fringes if you uh, get it flat to that amount. Um, but this, this gauge probably costs three to four hundred dollars, I believe now. So there's uh, there's a better way. So rather than uh, making uh, a spherometer with an expensive indicator, you don't need that. You don't have to spend a dime. Well, maybe exactly a dime, because what I'm going to show you is a simple indicator that's going to give you just as good a result, believe it or not. This is a scrap piece of three-quarter inch bolted birch cut into a triangle and I nailed three uh, aluminum nails on it that are going to be my teeth. Not, not teeth, but the feet. You just cut off the heads with a, uh, with a pair of wire cutters. And then, let's see. Like so. And then take a flat file and smooth off the tip of each one of these. Aluminum is nice because it won't scratch anything. It won't scratch your glass. But uh, do all three of them that way. And then um, I'm going to use, this is my indicator, it's a piece of brass. Uh, I think it's... Uh, 632 uh, threaded rod uh, cost you a dime maybe <laughs> maybe a little bit more I don't know but drill a pilot hole and then uh, run a tap through it and uh, just uh, tap is only three quarter inch long Okay, so this didn't take me very long to do. I, I um, tapped a hole with, with a tap and, and I rounded off all three of these roughly the same height. It doesn't have to be exact. And then I also stuck on a, a round uh, piece of plywood for a handle, tightened it down with some nuts. You say, well, this is that's just a simple crude spherometer, but actually it's not. Uh, it's actually it's, it's actually a gauge and not a spherometer because a spherometer has to be calibrated and this is this won't be calibrated anyway um, and uh, one of the things I did I rounded off the end of the brass screw you know, like I did the aluminum also um, this is this will be for a six inch flat and the radius is uh, like a quarter inch shorter than the radius of the of the flat um, just in case there's any rounded uh, rolled off edges or something. So here's a couple of six inch blanks uh, to be made into a flat. 
I put a chamfer on them and then I generated the curves relatively flat and then I ground them together for about uh, maybe five minutes with 20 microns. Still have a long way to go because I still have grinder marks I can see. But, um, but I do know that with the pencil test that these two curves are mated together so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we want to be sure to do. And to do, use my little gauge here all you do is you want to try to find uh, one of these two is going to be convex most assuredly it's not likely that they'd be flat but especially at this stage so one one is going to be convex and one is be concave very slightly so you set your gauge on here and turn it till it moves and at that point if you go too far the, the, the gauge will actually spin like a top. But what you're looking for is the crossover point where it, where it, when you, if you push on the corner at right angles, it moves, if it moves from all three, you're not touching in the center. And when you, you want, you want to find the point where it just barely, barely starts to touch. and then put it on your other part uh, and if it spins like this you know that this part is convex but it may not uh, this may be the concave part in which case um, you want to repeat this uh, process check it here and then see if it spins on here but between the two one of these is going to be convex and one is going to be concave and that's what this gaze will tell you. And you always want to run it uh, by hand or by machine. You want to be sure that your convex part is on top so that it reduces and becomes uh, works towards being flatter, which it will if it's on top. You always want to be sure that as you go through the grits, once I have this cleaned up, um, Every time you uh, take it off and clean it, you want to check it and make sure that you put your convex on top. Uh, if it switches, I mean, if it goes from convex to concave, then you want to put the other part on top so that the convex is always on top. And during each grit, you want to be sure that it switches at least once. That means you, you know you've gone through flat um, uh, when it switches. And when it is actually flat, you won't see any, any difference between either one of these with the gauge. Now there's probably some, some of you out there are thinking, Ed, you're crazy. How can a piece of wood and, with some nails and a screw in it even come close to an expensive uh, indicator? And let me prove it to you right now. I have two pieces of Pyrex. One's an opt optical flat and one's Almost, it uh, only has a half micron difference as measured with this gauge. And I have the feet set pretty much close together as my gauge. So I'm going to set my gauge on here. And I hope you can see there that it's reading zero. And then I'll tell you which one is the flat. And I'm going to set this one on here. And if you can see that. Where is it? This is measuring half a micron difference. So there's only half a micron difference and it's it's to the to the right. So this is relative to this part. This part is convex. So let me show you with my chippy gauge here. Set it on here and you adjust it so that It'll, it'll even squeak, and when you move it, it slides, it doesn't, it doesn't want to rotate around the center. Let me put it on this gauge, this part. It rotates about the center. So this is detecting a half micron difference between these two parts. It's a very, very sensitive test. As I mentioned, you only need one piece of glass to make a flat. You don't have to have two. 
I'm using two here because I happen to have an, a, uh, actually the back side of, a, of, a, of another piece that I could use. But I could have just as easily um, poured a plaster cast and then gone down to a local glass shop and have them cut out a, a six inch circle and then pitch it on or, or glue it on with epoxy to the plaster. As I mentioned, you only need one piece of glass to make a flat. You don't have to have two. I'm using two here because I happen to have an, a, uh, actually the back side of, a, of, a, of another piece that I could use. But I could have just as easily um, poured a plaster cast and then gone down to a local glass shop and have them cut out a, a six inch circle and then pitch it on or, or glue it on with epoxy to the plaster. Uh, but one thing you need to be careful when you're uh, grinding two pieces of glass together that have no the grooves in it. Um, when the uh, abrasive and glass, when the abrasive breaks down and it gets mixed in with a lot of glass particles and starts to dry out, there's a good possibility that the two pieces of glass will actually stick together and cause seizing and they're, they're really uh, difficult to get apart and it's risky to get them apart. So you want to avoid that if, uh, if at all possible. One way is to not uh, run the abrasive too long and also not to let it dry out. A better way to avoid it is to actually use, put grooves in the, in the tool uh, to let air in. Um, Actually, a tile tool is, is would be good for for doing that. Actually, works better with pennies than pennies in this case. But you always also want to be sure that you can stick your gauge on to, uh, to measure it, and the air will get in there and allow it uh, help uh, prevent it from seizing together. When testing flats without a collimating lens. The light rays travel a longer distance at the edge of the part than they do in the middle, causing a cosine error. Two flats in air contact have perhaps a one micron gap or so, so that at a reasonable viewing distance this cosine error can be insignificant. However, in water with a one millimeter water thickness, the path length is perhaps a thousand times more, plus the wavelength in water is 33% shorter so that the viewing angle A must be extremely small. Uh, this will cause a perfectly flat optic to show concave rings of power, which is why you need a collimating lens when testing in water. An auto collimating flat, however, doesn't need to be absolutely flat and um, can tolerate quite a few rings of power. It must, however, be free of any irregularity and the water test uh, even without a collimating lens can still test for irregularity. In this chart, uh, it shows how many fringes you can see without a collimating lens, given a water thickness of one millimeter for different size optics. Note that it never goes to zero. The point is that if you choose a viewing distance as long as practical, you can still use the water test for an auto collimating flat. You might even change the viewing distance slightly if your part has slightly more or slightly less number of fringes to make the fringes that you see straight. Finally, if you really need the flat to be absolutely flat, you can use fringe analysis software such as Fringe XP to measure the rings of power that you see, but try to have as few fringes as possible. You will need to verify the water thickness and here's a simple gauge you can make easily. You simply lower the micrometer until it touches the water.